I need a scar story. Tell me a scar story. All right. Well, there's there's plenty of scar stories, but I was... <laughs> they go so deep. They're very deep. There you go. Uh, there's many of them. They're very deep. <laughs> one you can't see, obviously, because it's underneath the headphones. Is there's a scar, a uh, linear scar on my ear. And Only an architect describes a scar as linear. Give me a break. <laughs> there you go. I have a curvilinear scar over here. Well, as long, depending as if I'm standing upright, it is vertical. But, but if you're hunched over the drafting table, yeah. But, yeah. Um, <laughs> but my linear scar, how did I get my linear scar? So, you know, kids and their BMXing back in the day. That's I, what we did. Oh, totally. And I jumped... A, uh, one of the jumps. Uh, as course, one does. As one does. Yeah. And the jump came apart as I was hitting it. So, Oh, it was a wooden ramp. I, I oh, see. It, was, yeah. it was, it was, it was held it together was, with staples. No, it was, it was a couple of found CMU blocks that we just yep, stacked up and yep. put the board on there. I mean, we don't check, we didn't have OSHA there to like double check to nope. make sure it was stable after each run. And of course, here I am making my run. And I've, I had like the heaviest of all of the bikes. Mine was like yeah. one of those steel. Um, yeah. It was it was it was a British bike. It was called a Royal Enfield. I don't know if you've okay. ever heard of them before. I've heard of them. Yeah, they make yeah. motorcycles. They, don't they they do make motorcycles too, but they also right. made BMXs back in the day. And mine Sweet. was all red, red seat, red handlebars, red you know the red mag wheels. Um, yep. And so you know I jump it, and of course it comes apart. So I basically hit the ground. Well, the guy, the next guy behind me had already started his run. <laughs> and you became a speed bump. <laughs> and so my head was down and he comes swinging by, hits me in the head oh. with, with the metal, um, pedal pedals and yeah. oh, the, man. you know, the nice serrated edge pedal and it mm -hmm. hits me and my head goes sideways. My ear tears open. Oh. <laughs> Oh, and yeah. Oh man, so many it good BMX a, stories from the day. It's, oh, it's funny you say gosh, there's no yeah. OSHA. There was no parents around. Like there was, there was no nobody parents. ever gonna yeah. check this kind of the safety rating. Oh, and now it's no, like not at all. Yeah, the, the hovering helicopter parents, right? Who are just like, oh uh, yeah, that, you know, that, we didn't buy that ramp from, from you know we didn't we didn't purchase that ramp from the a reputable dealer and or make sure didn't. that it has a full on safety certifications. It's like mm -hmm. we used to build ramps out of some piece of wood that we found and CMU blocks. Yeah. Oh yeah. Yeah. It's just like walking by somebody put their garbage out and they're like, Ooh, that'll make a great ramp. Yeah. You know, whether it would or wouldn't, which of course most of the time wouldn't, but it yeah. Got you in the air, man. The, it yeah. got, oh, yeah. it got, it got me in the air. I went tumbling over and when I hit the ground, I'm like hands on the ground, knees on the ground. I'm like pushing myself back up and my head is just, to get just at the right height to pedal get. Pedal height. Boom. Clocked. Clocked with oh. the uh, the pedal. I was Terrible. just like. Terrible. Uh, you said you had the heaviest bike. It's funny. This You you wish you had that bike now. Oh. Right? Like that, that yeah. bike would just be worth so much. Oh, more. yeah. <laughs> I look at, I watch these people who restore old PK rippers and dinos and GTs and red lines from back in the day, yeah. right? Real BMX days. Yeah. And they're worth like thousands of dollars now. Yeah. And I wish I had saved my super goose from back in the day. Oh, yeah. I had a yeah. red line that was stolen. But early on when I just started, I was fifth grade, I think I started BMX. My dad <laughs> took me to the bike shop and he's like, you build, build whatever you bike you want. And we went to this little bike shop in this Eastern San Diego County bike shop in this little town called Alpine and hmm. where we lived. And, and I picked out this, this frame, right. And it was like the curved metal frame oh, and, nice. and, and, and I, the heavy yellow mags and the guy, <laughs> the guy who was an old dude at the bike shop. And he was like, are you sure? Like, is this what you really want? And I was like, I was just going by what it looked like, exactly. right? I wasn't going exactly. Yeah, exactly. anything else. Had pedal brakes, like like all of the stuff that was old school compared to, you know, the BMX bikes of the day. Because there's all these other like really simple line frames and everyone was going with spoke wheels. And it was like, I was going the opposite direction of everybody else. And I, I learned very quickly after the bike was built that like, this was not a cool bike, man. It was no. not cool at all. <laughs> no. People used to make fun of it because it was all red. I was, 
all red. You know? I went for a green frame with yellow wheels. It was like the lemon lime <laughs> <version> <laughs> nice. of your cherry cola. I had the lemon lime bike. Here, here comes seven up Troxel. That's right. And I did think I, I had a yellow seat too. I cor- oh, color no. coordinated the, the mags to the seat. Did yes. you, did you have did and yellow grips? I was going to say, did you have yellow grips? Did you, yep. did you have yep. any of the pads? Like crossbar pad or no? Okay, so pads. this bike had all the curved frame. Curved. Oh, okay. Yeah, 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 yeah. So <laughs> there weren't pads for my. Bike. <laughs> uh, and let yeah, me. Just... It wasn't until I got into the next town, the next grade, that I actually figured things out and, and had a cool chromoly tubed, uh, yeah. you know, red line bike. It was pretty sweet. And and tell me if the it did, didn't matter if you had pads or not. They didn't help. No, they didn't help. Nope. I mean, no, it, your bike was a crotch bat. I no, mean, no, no matter what. Oh, the, wor- the worst, <laughs> I'll tell you, the worst of, you want another scar one on that BMX. Um, deep, so, deep scars, deep, deep scars cuts. Here. So, <laughs> oh my gosh, this one, this one's just, so we had this, you know, shopping mall near our house and because of floor is flat is all get out. But for some reason, um, all of these all of the parking lots and stuff were, you know, had hills and stuff on them. Don't know why. I mean, we're flat. Drainage. Yeah, yeah, whatever. For fun. Probably. Well, yeah, because here was the fun is it was raining and all of the pavement was slick. Mm-hmm. And a buddy of mine was out in front of me. And for some reason, he slammed on his brakes, skidded sideways. But when he skidded sideways, he lost control and he went down. Well, I'm... <laughs> like right here and I'm right and of course what do I do I go right into him I go up over the handlebars I I the bike's gone I'm fly over him I land on the ground on my hands and knees wet pavement and I'm sliding down the hill oh. shredding shredding, shredding. In yes like you know like, grinder. oh totally yeah. And then, of course, what did we feel like doing? It was just like, oh, I'm hungry. So you remember? Um, you know what I think of when I look at my palms after I've slid down asphalt? Oh, yeah. I'm I've, I've got I'm bloody all over the place. You know, I even hit my head and didn't realize that I had blood come dripping <laughs> from my Because no there were no helmets. Because there's no helmets. You know, no it's like no one's going to wear helmets, even if we if there were. No. Um, God, what was it? Was it Cracker Barrel? It was. Do you remember? I don't know if you remember in, in the shopping malls. The the shopping mall that used to like hand out cheese and sausage. No, I don't. You don't I remember? Oh the, my gosh! The I wasn't in the. I was in Florida. <laughs> okay, <laughs> but I, I'm pretty positive it was either it was it was something. Somebody you know anybody watching or listening or commenting, please like let me know if you guys yeah. remember it. It was red checkerboard. I I feel like it was Cracker Barrel before it was Cracker Barrel. The sh- the shop. I mean the. The restaurant, mm. it was like this place that sold basically meats and cheeses, which, you know, I mean, well, I mean, sure. And so I was like, you know what? I'm hungry. Those. I'm I'm bleeding. I want some meat and cheese. So, oh, man. So I had That's to go in, in, in. And then I walk up the lady who had, was like, you know, outside holding like the platter because they like stand outside and like, you know. You know, free samples. It's like Wetzel's pretzels. Today. Oh yeah, 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 yeah. They're just giving away free samples. Free yeah. samples, and so I walk up. They're looking at me so horrified. They're like, "Are you okay? Should we call? You yeah. know, um, you know, right. uh, security? Yeah, I like, just want know, some meats and cheeses. I just please. want some meats and cheeses, man. Yeah, have and another. Just, exactly. Oh, I had like a whole. It was so funny because like they, sh- they feel sorry for you and they give you a bunch or not. Oh, oh, I had a handful, but the problem was is that my hands were so bloody. <laughs> it was just. Uh, enjoy enjoy that everyone enjoy I'm that enjoy story. the visual let's yes. enjoy the visual exactly yeah. you, you pull out any old pictures if you send them my way we'll put them in the show uh, <laughs> we didn't have pictures I mean if could you just imagine how horrified people would be if we had iPhones back in the day when we were oh you know gosh, yeah Hellions doing the things we were not allowed to doing do. Doing the yeah. things that we were not allowed to do. And yeah. Right. Although you said it's just like, you know, the parents didn't know where we were. 
what was didn't the care. what was the yeah, I didn't know did, didn't, didn't care didn't know didn't care but what was the one <laughs> how could you tell where everybody was if you were out looking for your friends how could you tell where they were mm, good question i don't know how how could you tell because all of their bikes were in that person's front yard oh i see what you mean yeah, yeah. totally it's like totally. You they you would just be a pile of bikes yeah it's the, just like lawn. man yeah. i wonder where my friends are you can't like you, you know it's pre-texting so i can't text them like hey where are you you know it's just well, like it, it i walk around the neighborhood it's just like oh there they are they're it over was at Jimmy's. An art of dismounting the bicycle right because it became oh, yeah. like a how can you get off and ghost ride the bike oh, and totally. see how far it goes until it crashes into something and right but it was it was all about like distance like how far will it go oh, by yeah. itself and and then how cool could you look walking away and not look at the bike because you knew it was just like this perfect dismount right and you, yeah. as you walk toward the door of the house it was i mean straight out of stranger things oh yeah yeah, yeah totally yeah oh ghost ghost uh, ghost riding oh my gosh yeah it was it yeah. was so funny to just like you know, you hop off or you hop, you know, like side saddle a little bit and exactly. then you just, and then you, you know, give it the shove. Give it a little kick. Yeah, yep. exactly. <laughs> it just keeps on going. And it's just like, and then as you, oh my God, you just brought up a memory. So I uh, might as well tell it. Um, yeah. So I did that and I like launched the bike, right? So I'm side saddle and I was the first one to have like the, um, you know, like the little fork, what are they called? Pegs? Pegs, yeah. yeah. So, and and for both the for the front and the back, and so and those pegs were not for doing tricks; they oh, were no. for for hauling friends. Oh, you to totally, to ex exactly. <laughs> so I get off, yeah. and I like I launch the bike off, and I push it, and it's moving, and it's going straight for my friend Jimmy's dad's uh, uh, suburban, and oh. yes, <laughs> there was red marks all over his blue suburban. Oh, poor, poor Jimmy. And because J I, Jimmy would get the flack for that, wouldn't he? No, because Jimmy's dad was home and Jimmy's dad heard the, th the thumb. Oh. He heard yeah. the hit and came yeah. out and he knew immediately he that, was, yeah. he was retired military and we never forgot it. As you're wearing your army shirt. I'm wearing yeah. my army shirt. You know what it's like. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. The PTSD oh. kicks in immediately oh, when the BMX gosh. bike hits the Suburban. He was, it was so funny. It's like, I grew up in Florida and I don't think that I had a Floridian friend, Floridian, a native born Floridian friend. Everyone I mean, was a transplant. Everyone was a transplant. Um, mm -hmm. He was a New Yorker and you know, had that New York attitude, you know, ex-military, you know, and all this other stuff. And so when he came out and he saw the, the dent in the, it was, it was an a dent dent it was more of like a crease but it had red paint across it oh, oh man. man good times well that was a fun little fun little sidestep there that was a good way to kick off the episode oh, here. yeah yeah so oh yeah we're recording an episode so you okay so so i want to i want to i did have something in mind to, to talk about a little bit right. i don't know if this is a full show thing but it is something definitely that we've touched on but it was something that um, speaking about kids and speaking about, you know, how, how, you know, we used to, you know, parents didn't really care where we were or what we were mm -hmm. doing and stuff and how we are very helicopter parent now. And, and let's be honest, we, the pair, you know, the, the, the parents, we are the parents, we are the kids of the parents who didn't care, but now because they didn't care, we over care. Yeah. The pendulum has swung. <laughs> the yes. pendulum has swung. <laughs> if that was a hard way of saying that, but yeah, okay, right. So there's this lady on a local Facebook group for the Gross Point area, and she was reaching out and she was asking, "Hey, my son is a um, he's an architecture student, and his intern summer internship fell through. Does anybody know about anything?" Which is great, you know. I mean, reach out and you know try to find some contacts. That is fantastic. Use your, network. Use Use your, your network. social network. Yeah. However, I will say this, and so this is where, you know, I just I got I had to step in. You know, I I looked at it. I don't I don't I had to step in. I had to step in because <laughs> the the very first comment <laughs> that then started a conversation between these two people, the mother and this this person, was, oh well. Does it matter if it's paid or not? 
And so then it was follow exactly, exactly. <laughs> it's like lights going off. What? Wait, mm-hmm. what? <laughs> and so, so then it was okay. There was just then she'd responded. Experience is really more if if they pay, great. But if really about the experience, I'm like, eh. <laughs> time out here. <laughs> <laughs> no, 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 no. And so I like oh, I man. I had to jump in and I was just like, please, mm. please, please. This is we we can't. We can't this keep gone perpetu- far enough. I was like, we can't keep perpetuating <laughs> this. It's like, please don't allow your son to take a job for free. And then I kind of like, you know, went off on a tangent because then they started it, some of the people who were commenting, which clearly were architects um, or worked in the, in the business. Um, they started, they, they, they kind of like, you know, were coming at me and I'm like, well, look, we all know that every firm who hires an intern, a lot of times, or most all of the time, they are doing work, whether it's, you know, graphic work or something like that, that is something of either an endeavor, a pursuit, a proposal, a project that they're getting paid for. And so if you're doing labor for somebody who's getting paid for your labor, you should get paid too. Of period. course. And, oh and, and so after all of that, I kind of had to, you know, like... DM the mom and say, look, I didn't mean to start this, but look, I, I am very passionate about this. I do not believe an unpaid internship. Please do not advise your son to take it in. You know, I was like, I will, I, I just recently moved here. I've got a network of people, but I don't, you know, know that many people, but I will help your son find a job that pays him. If that'd be the case. And seriously. And so we had this, you know, conversation. It's just like, why? And so it wasn't necessarily because we already know. It's amazing how fast it went to that, right? It was it, like. It was. It was. I was like how, like everybody thinks. People are people, like, these are sharks in the water, man. And they're, they're yeah. looking for fresh meat. It was just like, look. I'll take him if he works for free. It, Jeez. Well, that was, that was kind of like, it's just like, does, you know, money matter? I'm like, yeah, yeah, of course it does. Does money matter to you? Do, Jeez. Do you work for free? Wow. It, this this whole notion of it's the honor of ex, the of the experience. Like, right. Right. Uh, honor. Where's the honor in that? Like like we right. like so many times we have clients who don't pay us for a long period of time. Where's the honor in that? Where's your honor where's your right. honor when you're like crying about paying your your consultants or paying your staff or paying yourself? Where's the honor in that? It's the same thing as get, you don't want to set this bad precedence. When you are trying to avoid paying the lowest paid person in the firm, that sets a very dangerous precedent. Yes. Like that shows yes. you that the the lack of business acumen to where yeah. you can't even afford the cheapest person in the office mm-hmm. and instead try to kind of rewrite the narrative to say, it's an honor for you to be able to participate in this. And it's like, that doesn't make any sense. Like if, yeah. if anybody actually applied their thinking to that, even if that's what happened to them. Right, right. Like it, that doesn't matter. That doesn't make it okay. Even if that's what their experience was. That, that is the point that it, okay. Somebody did it to you. It's, it, you know, it's, it's that old, you know, adage of this is like, who hurt you? And obviously we all have, you know, been through this whole, who have hurt you. I've never, never Talk about scars, Cormac. We're, we're, oh, still, we're still on the scar theme here. Ex- exactly. It's just like, <laughs> so I will say that I have never worked a free job, ever. Me either. I mean, sometimes yeah. it might feel like it because the payment comes a lot later. I would never have. Well, that's true. But yeah, but that, like, I just, it wouldn't have even crossed my no, mind that that no, was something acceptable not. to like, do. Right. It, you know, it wasn't even practice. You know, when I, my first internships were in Montgomery, Alabama, and you know, they had in, in even, I think I told this story, you know, he'd go, like, you know, he was doing hand drafting hand drafting and yes, it, 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 we are that old. Did you ride um, to the office on your BMX bike? Yeah. I, I would have loved to, <laughs> but so doing the hand drafting, I, guy came up to me, looked at it, asked me to untape it from my desk and balled it up and told me it was horrible. And it was just like, it was. And then he, thankfully, he sat down and he went through everything and, you know, showed me how to do it right. 
showed me how he while, goes while you were in shock while I was in shock because <laughs> I will say demoralizing it was at the time I didn't understand the the different sizes weights and and everything else mm. of, of all of the different rapidograph pens the you know double lot you know and all of these other things and you know went through gave me a tutorial of, on how to like clean and ink pens and how to like actually like prepare a sheet you know especially because Apparently, I'm, you know, left-handed people have this problem with getting the ink and all that other stuff up against, you know, the side of your hand. And, and I am mm -hmm. notorious with mm -hmm. that. And so, mm -hmm. you know, showed me, showed me everything. But you know what? Even though he crumbled up my paper, I still got paid for it. I still got wow. paid for it. Yeah. Because right. they were getting paid for it. In that church that I did the floor plans for still stands today. <laughs> yeah. But it was something that I've never thought that we should perpetuate this practice, this practice of, and we do know that a lot of like the star architects love to, and I hope they don't do it anymore, but love to, you're working for me for the honor of it. And so mm -hmm. you get, you the won't, privilege. you, yeah. you won't get paid, but God, won't it look great on your resume to say that you work for yeah. Evan Troxel Extraordinaire? Yeah. Speaking of Stark attacks. Exactly. Oh. Speaking of <laughs> egos. Oh, man. But I mean, oh, my Lord. It just so turned quickly against me. And I was just like, people, 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 please. Just just because you did it doesn't mean that it's right. And this yeah, is don't keep it some, going. You know, and I even said, I, I even like. This is like totally antithesis to the whole idea of paying it forward. This is. Oh, like, yeah. Yeah. No, it's. It's. Oh my gosh. It's not. It's not paying us forward. It's paying it back. Yeah. I got abused. I am going to abuse. Why? We, right. we are in such a crisis of staffing right now. We know. Architects this. are cheapskates. I'll just yeah. say it. It's, yes, it's crazy. Are. I mean, you look at like avoiding paying for software licensing fees, keeping computers around for. 10 years, like the productivity, Gosh, yes. not valuing the hours that we spend on rudiment, like just rote things that should be fully automated. Like there's yeah. just so many examples of that. And it's just like, and, and yet you'll choose to nickel and dime a, an intern. Right. 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 Yeah. It makes no sense. Uh, exactly. And you know, it's, it's, you know, it's funny is that we actually started with these like scar stories, but yeah. I mean, it really is. It's, it's these scars. It is, it is these scars that still linger in the profession that's really kind of keeping the profession down. Mm, you know, yeah. pe people who say, oh my God, there's conversation about, you know, going back to the office, um, you know, more and more hours or more, more and more days. And there's a lot of people who are up and I'm saying, I don't know if I can do that. And it's not that they don't want to work. It's they have been so used to a different kind of working. And I, this is kind of a little mm -hmm. tangent here, but they've been used to a different kind of working that people need. And this is, this really is a conversation that I've had with a lot of different firms, not just, you know, my firm, but other people's firms that are really struggling with this dynamic of, you know, the hybrid working, the remote working, the full butts and seeds, five days a week working in in, in trying to find that balance between all of those different things, because even people who are seasoned have gotten into a lifestyle now that is different from pre COVID era that they're not really sure that they really need to go back and be, you know, 100% button seats. This is 100% about surveillance management. I mean, yes. that's 100% what it is. I mean, this is about the justification of hierarchy yes of people who are higher up in that hierarchy making sure in air quotes that people are doing the work that they're supposed to be doing yeah to justify their position it's it's not to justify the people who are doing the work's position the work either gets done or right. it doesn't right. period it doesn't matter where you're sitting when that happens right it right. either happens or it doesn't but to justify the position of people who need to make sure that somebody else is working yeah does not make any sense at all and this is i this is kind of a corporate uh disease that, you know, that happens it's not just in architecture either 
Absolutely. And, th- and that, that is like 100% exactly the issues that, how do I know that Evan is working? I mean, it, I don't know if Evan's working because I don't see Evan's working here. There's this struggle and it, the, the struggle is real, but the, str- the struggle of how do we mentor? How do we mentor in a hybrid environment or how do we mentor in a work from home environment? Now I get that. I trust me because I've lived that struggle, but there are mm-hmm. ways around that. There are, there are creative ways around that too. You know, having open, open office hours where, you know, essentially, and I, I think I've, I've talked about this before, but you know, where you, you essentially just log on You're you're in, uh, Oregon, I'm in Michigan, you know, somebody else is in Maryland and we're all working on the same project together. We all log on. You, you may say, Hey guys, a zoom I, room, open a zoom, open room. a zoom yeah. room. And you just, and you're just there. And if somebody has like a question or if you and I are talking about something and we've got a couple of interns that are, you know, working with us or some recent graduates or, or whoever, and they hear the conversation, it is very much, very similar to like the dialogue that we would have if we were sitting next to each other in the office. And you know, that we learn a lot from osmosis of just listening to other conversations, right? Sure. Or listening to how somebody conducts themselves on a phone call or, Mm. or anything else, or just the simple fact that, you know, Hey, I'm clicking and I'm working on something. And Evan, you've asked me to do these details and I start doing these details. But since we have this open office, this open zoom room, here we are. I was like, Oh, wait, hold on. Let me, let me at least show you what I'm working on. Is this exactly what you're asking me to do? It's a, it's a lot easier because I have found that if you don't have that kind of like open free exchange dialogue, a lot of interns don't really know what to ask. And so they don't ask and that's okay. Yeah. That, that there's an issue there though, right. Where it's, it's like this, they don't want to appear like they don't know. Right. Right. And there's also this weird thing in architecture where everybody always knows all the answers. And it's, <laughs> and so there's this, there's this kind of, I could just, they're, they're, they're scared, right? That, right. Like there's a fear there too. Right. And, and so if you, if you set and I, because what I absolutely don't want to come across as is that in-person meeting doesn't matter because right. Right, 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 right. it does, but the, the office is a tool. The office is not a, shouldn't just be the given framework to get work done because right. obviously it's not. Right. It used to be a, a given framework for how work is done and now it isn't anymore. And to force fit work back into that framework doesn't make sense for everybody. Right. It might make sense for some people more than others. It definitely makes sense at certain times more than others. It definitely makes sense on different phases, potentially more than yeah. others. Yeah. Right. But again, like the, the space is a tool. Right. And so what resources are available there that make sense for people to come to, to do the thing? And right. then disperse and 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 do the other things, right? Like that Absolutely. to me, it just makes sense. And we have the ability to plan for all of that. And planning is usually the success of a project or not. Right. It's not anything else. Like the planning is, we figure all this out, and then we go off and we do the work. And if we figure it all out together, or we figure it out in a Zoom room virtually, like it doesn't matter to me. Like, but use the tool for what it's best for. Absolutely. It, it, I saw a post earlier uh, on LinkedIn from Canoa. I think it was Federico Negro over at Canoa talking about the different types of offices. And there's either like the really badass office, which provides everything mm-hmm. like mm-hmm. food, beverages, the, all the types of spaces that you need, all the resources, resources you need. Or there's the extremely flexible office that is like super utilitarian. And it's just like this, you know, you, you jump in, you jump out. Right. So it, it's like, those are two extremes. The ones in the middle are going away, is what he's what he's saying, especially in urban areas. Like, just like, what do we do with this space? It's not very useful. People aren't showing up. People are supposed to show up, but they don't. And supposed to, right? Because somebody said so. Right. And right. Right. even though it doesn't necessarily make sense for the kind of work that they're doing. So the, the middle kinds of offices that it's like real squishy don't make a lot of sense anymore. And people are struggling to figure out what to do because they're spending a lot of money on them. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Uh, so I, this, the struggle is real, but it, really, I think it comes down to the indecision about what to do with the space because it isn't like it used to be. 
right. And right. instead of evolving, we're still hanging on really tightly. So, okay, here. I don't know if the in in you and I actually walked into one of those extreme, you know, far extreme offices that had almost everything there. Mm-hmm. And you know, you talking about shop. I wasn't going to name. Talking about? I wasn't going to name names. Why not? <laughs> <laughs> but but the thing that I the thing that I worry about yes but the thing that I would worry about is places like that that have like everything it's almost like you don't need to go anywhere you you can stay here all the time right. and it's and then you look at the faces of the people who it doesn't are mean there. you have to it doesn't mean you have to it right mean uh, you well have th- to. there is still a cultural <laughs> architectural cultural uh, component the, to this that's where sure. I was kind of going it's but it's in tech like, too it was in tech oh, it was like oh, yeah, everyone yeah. had a, a breakfast bar and a lunch bar and a oh and gosh. a beverage yeah. and a coffee bar and a beer bar and a ping pong table and it's like at some point those really surface things were considered perks and then everybody like never used them right and it was like what's all this what are we spending money on all this stuff for so right yeah right. there's there's different levels of nuance within that argument as well well you know and, and the thing is like you have an open office you have a ping pong table or you have a pool table like right in the middle of the office and you have other people who you know ooh, i need a break i'm gonna go play pool and then you're like right next to a cubicle of somebody who's trying to actually do work. Right. Yeah. Really, dude? Then really? there needs to be a rule about when people can use the ping pong table. And it's just like, and, okay, and then it's well, just I'm like, not going to play if there's a rule. Like, <laughs> Right. And then it's just like, well, well, then what's the point? What's the point of having right. one there? You know? right. Although I will say the firm that I wasn't going to name, but you named, what I found astonishing was is the... And and even your old firm had it too, which I was always so like, you know, amazed when I went into that office. So you have a coffee bar and a nitro um, Mm. coffee bar, you know, cold brew. Coffee tap. You know, and all of these things. It was just like, (laughs) what? Like we've got like old like pump coffee things and it's just- Welcome to Denny's. (laughs) Exactly. You know, hold on a minute. (laughs) You know, it's just like- You wanted ashes in your hash brown? Right. You know. Uh, <laughs> you had that version. <laughs> exactly. We had that version. It's just like, oh, so flavor, you know, you, you just you just want to like, ooh, you know, you take right. the drink of coffee right. and so, yeah. But, um, uh, man, I always, I look at him and it's just like, is that a red flag for you're expecting them to be there more than they should be? Or is that, oh, this is really nice because- you know, you have some cool perks. Oh, you Friday afternoons, you, you know, you can open up the, you know, open up the kegs and you can start drinking or, or beer 30, you know, throughout the week and stuff. And I'm always thinking to myself, who, who are the people who want to stay at the office drinking beer with their colleagues when they could be on their way home? <laughs> Drink, or meeting their fr- their real friends, or yeah. meeting their real friends or family <laughs> or whoever, to right. have that beer somewhere else. It is a it and, is a bit forced sometimes. Yeah. Oh, yeah. uh, and then the then the force we're a family the forced family fun days <laughs> those are always great too. It's like we're a forced family fun. Day. Yeah, it's like bring your family into the office so we can all have you know a good time with all of the family, and you think about it and right. those people. You know, you, you, you bring your wife. Family's like, I don't want to go to your it's office. It's just like, yeah. well, why, why do I want to go there? No. Right. I don't want that. Yeah. Right. God, well, I love it. I have, a, I have another topic here, and it's something that you sent me, which was, first it was a, a video by one of my favorite YouTubers, the Spirited Man, uh, Van, Van Neistat. Yes. And the, the title of this video, I'll put a link to it in the show notes, is Why Only Some of Us Think in Pictures. And, and then you posted a, or you sent me another video, a Ted talk yes, called the world needs all kinds of minds by Temple Grandin. Yes. I want you to set this up because I don't want to read your long ass text message here. It was very long, but it was very, I mean, it's very insightful. So you want to set this up? Yeah. So we share a lot of very similar YouTube channels and you actually had turned me on to the spirit of man channel and both uh, Van and Casey Neistat, fantastic YouTubers, do beautiful content. I mean, honestly, for people who are not architects, they have a very interesting sensibility. And so this this particular 
clip that I sent you about that he was talking about this audiobook and podcast that he was listening to from uh, Temple Grandin. And she was talking about, you know, because and, and if for people who haven't seen like the movie or anything else, she is a, you know, as, as she'll even say in, in the TED talk, you know, a high spectrum autistic thinker, but she thinks in pictures. And it started Van thinking very much the same, thinking about the way that he thinks. And it was very- Kind of explaining hit something that he's always kind of intuitively known, but didn't know how to maybe put words to or or- or even like it just, it wasn't a complete thought for him. It seemed like until he heard the podcast that she was on. Right. Cause, cause in a way what and it, read her book. Yeah, yeah. Cause in a way, what it was is he was always questioning the way he thought and was he stupid or was he special or was he this or was he that? Because he never really understood. Because he was definitely different. Cause he yeah. thought differently. And what was interesting mm -hmm. about that is, is I started to do a little bit of self-analysis on on that as well, because I very much think in pictures and there are, it, it's interesting because I'll write things down. I'm not writing things down to remember them. I'm writing things down to visualize the content of what I'm hearing so I can kind of understand mm -hmm. and my mind will start to think about things. I need to hear, listen, absorb, unravel, repeat in a way to visualize and then kind of like rewrap it into my head. And so there's like all these different processes that are, that I go through that are actually could be seen as slow. And it's not necessarily that it's, it's a way for me to visually understand and have my mind wrap around the visual understanding of anything and everything. Yeah. And so I might as well be, you know, like open up the, hold on, let me, uh, let me, let me get the couch. Um, please lay down. You tell me about your father. Well, but I mean, I will, I will be 100% honest with you that I, reading was always a struggle for me. Reading mm -hmm. wasn't a struggle for me to understand it. It was, I was slow at reading because I reread things over and over to visualize what was being said, or I would write down what was be what I'm reading so that I can visualize what is being said in the book, or I would yeah. even do pictures of what I'm reading to understand and visualize what is being said so that I can understand it in a way that it actually lasts longer. And, and I will give you an even further insight on that is I recorded Everything that I studied for the ARE, I read it out loud and recorded it and re-listened to it. And that's mm. when I was actually successful at studying and passing the ARE is when, when I was just reading it and trying to go off of it and then go into it and, you know, try to remember, oh, what did I read? You know, and all this other stuff. But when I set it in my brain, because I processed it, reprocessed it, rolled it through, you know, whatever churn that I have, and then kind of like represented it to myself of, through my understanding, through what I now understand, I was, I, now all of that stuff is stuck in my head. All of that stuff is things that I remember. Not mine, man. <laughs> it's all gone. <laughs> yeah. Well, but, but I, the interesting thing about that to me is that when you're writing, when I write stuff down, it's so that I can take a picture of it with my brain. Yes. Yes. Because yes. how many times have I gone back? I, I was doing it today. I'm like looking for something I wrote down six months ago in my notebook. I know what it looks like. Oh yeah. And I'm just looking for the page that matches the picture that's in my brain. And that's why I write it down. It's not so that I can remember it. It's not even necessarily right. so that I can find it later, but it's so that I can turn it into a picture. Because I remember things by pictures too. My wife was, she's always dumbfounded about like my mechanical abilities. Um, where I told her, you know, I, we listened to the, the Van Neistat uh, thing that we're going to be posting. And mm -hmm. she was just like, you know, that, that explains you a lot. It really does explain mm -hmm. you a lot. She's like. Which, and she's very different, right? And she's very different, you know, as, as a teacher, you know, she's, she's a word-based She's person. very yeah. word-based. And so. You know, she was just like, because you 
Jill, she's like, you're not a mechanic, but you are mechanically inclined. You can look at things and you can see, you know, it's like if I'm going to take apart something. And I remember the very first mm -hmm. time I ever did a set of drum brakes. I mean, you know, as well as I do, because, you know, you're a mechanic as well. Like, you know, that drum brakes are a pain. They're a pain in the butt mm -hmm. because you've mm -hmm. got all of these different springs that cross over. And, you know, mm -hmm. you've got them that, you know, they, they sit on the hydraulic actuators and all of this other stuff. And so you have to put them back together the exact same way you take them apart or they don't work, period. Right. And for some reason, I took a, my old TR7, you know, I, I pull the, the drum off and I'm looking at it. And I just sat there and I looked at it for a while, staring at the brake, staring at all of the crossovers, all of the pistons, all of everything, just looking at it, taking a mental picture. Of it, and then I took it apart. And I set everything down, essentially, you know, the way that I, I saw right. it up there. And I set everything down and laid it all out. And then I cleaned it all off and I changed the shoes. And then I put everything back together. And yes, did I cross the the um, springs over and put them in the wrong direction? I did because I inverted, I inverted the two wrong s springs. When I realized it as I was, you know, trying to bleed the brakes and that they weren't actuating, that was a, oh, well, I know what I did. And then I took it all apart and I swapped the the two springs around and I put it back together. And it's not just what it looks like, but it's, you you also understand how it works. by looking Exactly. At it. Exactly. Yes. I, I understand yeah. the mechanics behind it. Like, okay, if I press on, if I depress the brake, you know, the brake is going to, you know, send the hydraulic pressure to this, you know, to this cylinder and this cylinder is going to then push the little actuator as a, this <laughs> yeah. little actuator if is going to this, do, then that, you know, right. Cause exactly. and effect. Exactly. The cause yeah. and effect. And, <laughs> and that literally explains the whole process of my mind is the cause and effect. It's like, okay, if I do this, what is, what is going to happen right. next? Right. And, and I, and, and I use that as a training tool when I'm teaching any of the, the people that I'm mentoring is like, I always teach them the cause and effect. Okay. If you do that, you know, they're like, oh, is this wrong? No, no, I'm, I'm never going to say something is wrong, but what I want you to do is I want you to think about if you do that, what's next and next and next and next and next. Yeah. You're kind of playing out the mechanics right. in your mind in like an animation form or, you know, you're thinking through all the different steps. I, I right. tend to think exactly the same way. I, yeah. I will let them, you know, in a way I, because I'm playing the, all of the scenarios of what they're thinking about in my head. And I'm already picturing, oh, that's a bad idea, you know, and, and, but I don't want to tell them it's a bad idea because it yeah, may not actually, somehow. it may not actually be a bad idea. That's true. Yeah. You know, and I want them to run through the scenarios and if it's a bad idea, I want them to come to that understanding first and really like embrace, oh, okay. I see. I see what, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. you, you may not have said your hesitation, but you had some hesitation and now I understand exactly what you were talking about kind of thing. And, and so that was, that's really a thing. And so, okay. So back to, to Van Neistat's, um, uh, video, it, it basically was talking about how people, and I think I illustrated it with just my example of this is like how people think in pictures and that there is a different way of understanding the world and in, in how he was illustrating that was through very architectural methods. You know, he was, he was talking about, you know, this, this small little, um, seaside village in Mexico that he absolutely loves. He was talking about uh, how they board up the windows, thinking about all of these different things. And he took a, he basically took a mental picture of how they boarded up these windows and all of these other things, you know, and, and basically in part of his video, he does kind of like a little paper diorama of, of some of these things and how the thinking is and how you know, illustrating how, why, it, why it is, how it is, why it is, yeah. how it is and stuff. And it, it's so mm -hmm. interesting to think about because I've never really thought about it, but I will honestly say there are really two types of architects <laughs> and they are the, mm -hmm. you know, what was the exact, it wasn't visual learner, but, um, object, I think it had something to do with objects. Yeah. So it was like um, a visual object learner and then yes. there were like word learners. Right. Yeah, right. I can't remember. And, and, and really, if you think about it, if you think about the dynamics of, like, say, people within the project structure, like project managers, and there's even different types of, like, project managers that I'm learning. It's like, I'm a, I'm a different type of project manager than, like, say, a, you know, kind of numbers project manager, somebody who 
is is far more comfortable running the contracts and you know things like that which you know is just i will i will go to the grave hating 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 all of the administrative and you part shouldn't of do that stuff because you suck at it like I, you I just shouldn't you, there, there should be somebody who is really amazing at that filling out that piece of the puzzle because that's what they're good at that's what they love to do yeah and by forcing you to do something like that i mean it there's just no good ending <laughs> and you know <laughs> to that and some and and i will sit back and i will i will critique what i think i should know more of and it's things like that and then i think but the people who know all of that don't know half the stuff i know yeah <laughs> right. you know and so and there's way too many things to know and there's I mean, way the too many exactly yeah. It, and, and you're absolutely right. It's it's that let's set up, you know, and I had this conversation with a principal at the firm because we were talking about getting me, you know, now that this project is somewhat winding down and going to another project. And, you know, he was talking about a couple of projects that he knew I'd be very excited about, which I am. And this would be the kind of like dynamic. And I'm like, you know what, that that's actually makes a lot of sense because I'll be taking over kind of like this aspect and they'll be working on that aspect. And it, and it plays to the strengths of each of the people. There are those people who'd be like, oh, you know, I can't believe they put this person in charge of me or, or like, I'm going to be threatened by what they do. And this is like, that doesn't do any, any project any good. If you just stack it with people who are going to be like, I don't want to be, you know, told what to do kind of thing. It's just like, well, can you do it? Well, no, I can't. Well, then guess what? You're going to need to be told what to do, you know, or mm -hmm. you're going to yeah. need to work with that person and stuff like that. And, I've had, I've been having a lot of, and maybe this is something for, you know, a later conversation, but I've been having a lot of conversation about, we were doing a lot of actor, after action review um, of this current project that I'm on that's been two and a half years of design work. I mean, that's a long time to be working on, but just like really the, the design and documentation phase of something. And, you know, there's, there's been ups, there's been downs, there's been a lot of like, in you know, like just a lot of sideways a lot of sideways and we you know we had a good heart to heart about like okay what were the successes and the failures of this and and a lot of it is like project dynamics experience dynamics um personality dynamics and those are things that most of the time people don't take as seriously as they should when they're work you know when they're putting together a project because they just like oh you know, Evan, you just came off of this project. Hey, I'm going to go throw you onto Cormac's project. Cause Cormac's project, Cormac's been begging for help and, you know, you're going to help. Mm -hmm. You and I may not work together well on this, or we might actually have the same tools for a project and, but I need something Redundancy. else. Redundancy. Yeah, and right. we don't, you know, in projects don't need that. And, and there's so much, so much lack of, <laughs> let me just say, lack of effort in project dynamics. Um that really tend to lead to a lot of burnout, a lot of resentment, a lot of like, oh, my career's not going anywhere, especially here. I'm going to go somewhere else kind of thing. And it's yeah. just, you know, it, I always ask everybody, what do you want to get out of this project? Not like, you know, what role do you want to do? Do you want to do bathroom details or do you want to do ceiling details or things like that? I don't care about that. You're going to do them anyway. Like we're all going to do them. You know, you're going to do them. I'm going to do them. Everybody's going to do, them. you know, because that's what it's going to take. But what do you want to get out of this project? What do you want to learn? What do you feel like you don't know that you think this project can help you learn to further advance your career and your experience and your understanding of architecture? And if you never start a project with those, that ideal in mind, in my own personal opinion, or at least my own personal experience, you're setting yourself up for failure. Mm -hmm. And, you know, there's been projects where I've worked on where we've just kind of like rushed through it and it's literally a fire drill from start to finish. And you're just like, well, what is there's no North Star? Yeah. Exactly. It's just like, well, what did you mm -hmm. learn? You know, what did you want to learn from this project? I want I learned that I didn't want to do this project. And so, you know, it's it's really interesting to think about how that I don't know that that just that that dynamic really sets you up for success or failure. 
I think the interesting thing about his video is it just really talks about the different kinds of brains that are out there. And obviously yeah. he's inspired from Temple Grandin, who is, you know, like she, a self-proclaimed visual thinker and how she would present herself because she said, I think it was kind of self, she was just saying like, I was a terrible speaker. I couldn't get oh, yeah. up and, and here she is giving a Ted talk, right? Right, but, right, right. Um, nowadays, but, but back then she was just, she didn't feel confident in her personal presentation and yeah. so she would let the drawings that she did do the speaking for her. And that's how right. she won a lot of work to, in the cattle industry where she was prolific, right, ultimately. Right. right. But her drawings were beautiful. And I, it's, it's amazing to me to think about the parallels to architecture between oh, what yeah, she yeah. did and what Van does even on his, on his YouTube channel where he's creating these little paper dioramas and, and things. And like, are they perfect? No, they're, they're perfectly impor imperfect, though. And... The, the, the visual communication style is what architects are good at. And, and it's interesting to me to think about the parallels of letting the work do the speaking. And I mean, this also leads to downfalls for architects too, right? It's like oh, the yeah. work speaks yeah. for itself and we'll get work because of how good the work looks. And, and so th that isn't necessarily we true do, either. But yeah. we do fall back on these crutches of, and we do tend to like group together um, with this personality traits or, you know, the right. DNA, the wiring that we have. And, and it is really interesting to think about it. So I would highly recommend that architects watch that video. Yeah, absolutely. You know, it's, it's funny. It's, uh, when I was watching that, it was just like, yeah, it's like when somebody, when I'm trying to explain something nine times out of 10, it will always be some form of visual way of, of explaining things. My you wife know? hates this, right? Yeah. It's like, I, I just want to draw you a picture. I don't have time for that. Just tell me in words. And I'm like, but it's not going to work. Like, yeah. Well, I, I mean, do it. <laughs> you know, I use my hands. I, I talk with yeah. my hands a lot. And so during ACE is a great example. It's like we have all these different mentors and the way that this particular ACE program was, was a lot different from, you know, the other ones. It was, it was kind of interesting because it, it had all of people were in like, you know, this big group you know, in this big room and they were just broken up into tables and like some of the, like the lead mentors would like walk around and they would like ask questions and stuff. The program organizer for ACE Detroit is a structural engineer. And so she came up and she was asking them about different forces. You know, the kids were, you know, like thinking about that. And so I was like, explain, I was she describing them with words and you, she and was describing them with, <laughs> and you're like, what? Well, Exactly. It was just like, everything was like zipping past them and stuff. And I was, I was like using my hands and I was just like, it was like, think about like this, these forces and these forces and like compression and tension and like all, I was using my hands, you know, using like your double jointed through. knuckles Ex to show exactly. <laughs> deflection. Just like, you know, like deflection and you know, all these <laughs> other things, and, you know, it's just like freaking me out. Everybody's got to watch the YouTube version of this. Like Cormac's a hand speaker. This is where the, uh, just a reminder, subscribe to our YouTube channel where you can see his uh, crazy man claws in action here. Ugh. Maybe you don't want to see this. I don't know. Uh, you're welcome. <laughs> or the, the great thing that they did, though I wasn't a big fan of them giving me a Microsoft um, Surface tablet uh, or Surface laptop was at least it was a writable Surface that I could sit there and I can pull up the annotate tools and zoom and start sketching over things. And I sketch in such detail that I literally could s sketch to scale, just draw something out to them. But more so when I'm doing things like that and I'm like actually showing them the detail, I'm explaining to them the why of the detail and, and walking through it and showing them like, you know, I'll like draw the forces on like a bracket and say, well, this is why we put you know, a bolt here and here below, both above and below the bracket so that, you know, if you've got this overturning motion, how to like put in a bolt, you know, the, the carrier and all of this other stuff and just all talk through it all so that they really understand exactly what it is. But because you, know, you just knew, know that stuff intuitively, you, you, you already and, know. And, and so <laughs> the, and, and what's funny is it's just like, they'll say, well, you know, write it down. I'm like, huh? I, yeah. I mean, just transcribe like, what, it, what I just, just said. Like, like, there you go. Here, here it is. <laughs> What don't you understand about this? It is interesting you know? for us visual people to understand that there are people who need the words. Right? Exactly, and, and, exactly. And that we are different and that we communicate uh, differently yeah. and, and learn differently. 
Yeah. I th- one of the interesting things that he said in that video was that there are people who love Ikea instructions no, and there are people God. who hate Ikea instructions. Uh, and I'm it's funny fan. because I've never thought about that. I've always loved Ikea instructions. I never yeah. thought about the people who hate them. I don't even, there, <laughs> to me, there are no words other than numbers. There there, there, right. There's there's numbers, you know, it's just like, you're supposed to have, you know, five Three of these, five of these, you yeah. know, five fluking bolts, you know, <laughs> <laughs> you know right. but I mean, it's just like, I, I just put together, uh, I, I, I got a kind of like a, a small love seat for my daughter's room and, you know, it came with all the different size bolts and, you know, it's just like, you know, so, okay. It's like, not these and so, bolts. And so I, I, I just, I just lay them all, I lay them all out to count everything. And I'm supposed to, all right, I'm supposed to have four of these, four of these, four of these, four of these. Check, 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 check. Got them all, you know. And then. It's like Legos. I and... honestly, here's, here's the funny thing. I don't actually have to turn to the next page. All I have to say is, this is all of the stuff that you need. And then I'll start looking at all the pieces. I'm like, oh, this goes here, this goes here, this goes here, this goes here, this goes here. Yeah, and then. Right. I'll go back and I might flip through the, the instructions and say, okay. Yeah. It's also oh, because you've done because... it before. You've oh, done something, yeah. yes. some other Ikea, like that does help for sure. <laughs> Had, having the uh, the experience at Ikea, yes. And uh, plenty but that's, of experience. that's where Ikea. wisdom is, right? It's not just the the checklist of things, but it's, true, true. This, the wisdom does come in from the experience of doing well, it before. Well, you know, it's funny is like, so I've had my son on numerous occasions, I've had him they're helping me chain brake pads or, you know, swap out rotors and all of this other stuff. And he's gone through it. And so now he's back from college and he's starting to drive my wife's car more and more. And I was just like, before you really get crazy, I I need to change the brakes. And he's just like, well, if you just get the material, I'll go ahead and change them. I, I, <laughs> tear. A it's tear just falls. like, here, hold on. Yeah. Let me dab my tear. Cause it, yes, it was totally, right. it was just like, wow. He's, Aww. you know, now granted, I would totally be out there to make sure that he, you know, cause he's only changed brakes twice. Well, you, you teach him once, then you supervise and then you let him fly. Right. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. Well, I want to let, I want to let him fly, but I also don't want him to die. Not that kind of fly. <laughs> There's so many cool little points in that video. Oh. And then watching her TED Talk, kind of, I've, I think I've seen it before, but it was great to watch it again and think about it. You know, the, the whole argument, maybe we, we can wrap up with this one. We're, we're an hour in already. But this idea of, you know, he held up the book in his video, mm-hmm. uh, Matthew B. Crawford's uh, Soul Craft. Oh, oh Yes. It, I'm trying to remember it exactly. It's totally escaping me right now, but it's soul, soul class. I can't even remember. I'm going to pull it up because I have it in my audible uh, library because you recommend, you recommended it to me. Yeah. It's a, it's an amazing book and it made me want to read it again, but it's, 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 it is incredible, but it really talks about the value of blue collar work. And this comes from a guy I think who has a degree in psychology who went to work for a big think tank in like DC or New York and was a total knowledge worker, you know, total white collar cubicle think tank and, and then started up a motorcycle maintenance and repair shop. Right. And it like went the other, the pendulum swung the other way. So what's it called? Shop class as soul craft. Thank you. I I had soul in there too many times. Yeah. Shop (laughs) class as soul craft by Matthew B. Crawford and incredible book. And the, the whole idea of, you know, the real strong push for STEM classes now, which is completely different Mm -hmm. than the shop classes that we had when we were kids. And, you know, I had, I had architectural drafting, there was wood shop, there was metal shop, there were art classes. A lot of these have been removed from education, primary, middle school, high school education over the years. And now we're kind of trying to slip STEM classes in as maybe a replacement for these, right? But it's not. It's still very cerebral. It's still very abstract. And it's not hands-on making things with with your hands, right? And so that's where the hands-on part comes in, right? But it's it's just interesting to me, like that's how I that you talked about being mechanical. I that's that's actually all I want to do is make stuff. Yeah. Right. And, 
And because there is such an intimate connection with the things, like I have so many tools. I love my tools. I have patina. I've made tools to make other things even. <laughs> Yeah, And I, that's what I love about tech, actually, is making tools, the making tools part of it that enable people. The whole point of tools is leverage, right? To be able to do things that you can't do with your body and you have a tool that makes something possible. It's the right. same with digital for me. And so this idea of this whole class of people is missing of yes. current and future generations. And... We see this in our offices today, this disconnection of how to put things together, of right. understanding how these pieces, when they go together in a certain way, achieve this specific outcome because it is so paper thin. Everything right. that's going on right. in school is paper thin. And there may be an understanding of the theory, but there no, there's no application of the theory. There's no experience of the application. And I just, I, I really... I th it's it's sad to me that that doesn't exist anymore and that there right. was there hasn't been enough of an understanding of the value right of that right. in in education but also even today in an architectural office where we don't let people go to job sites because there's no time right right or or there's some insurance risk or there's some bs story about how architects can't get involved in that part of the process, right? right? And and so that to me is the real disservice where I, I have a, a big fear for the future of our profession. Absolutely, because talking about all of that, the lack of the shop class and stuff, I mean, I actually learned better, I learned mathematics better when I understood the application of it. So, you know, or physics. Physics was one that once I really started to understand like the mathematics behind the mechanics, which is physics, then I started to understand physics a hell of a lot easier because I understood, oh, that's what a lever is. That's what this is. You know, that's what that is. You know, all of these simple notions of teaching. And that's the thing is like, you know, and my wife, you know, we talk about this a lot. And she actually, again, when we were watching that video and stuff, she was just like, a lot of times I will start to, I can identify the way these kids early on, because you know, she's an elementary school teacher. And she starts to recognize that there are people, you know, kids who are learning differently and so she's like, okay, how do I get them actively engaged in learning? Because the curriculum as it's set up, which is kind of more STEM based, there's isn't, no place for them. Is it yeah. going, they are not going to succeed that way. And people right. will, people start to give up on those kids. Oh, well, that kid's just a dummy or whatever, you know? And she'll say, no, 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 no. The kid learns differently and we need to teach that kid differently. And, and that acknowledge that. And that, that was... That it's it's right. it's weird because the the school education system is a machine to process students to right. pass tests right. Right? right which is the indicator which is the KPI for schools to <laughs> to get funding like it is a, it is a completely screwed up in my view system i can't even imagine my kids doing the co2 powered cars down the hallways like we did it was a blast i loved it we you know, not only and did we learned, we doing it. we learned, yeah. you know, we learned about propulsion. We learned about, you know, we actually did math problems about, you know, the velocity, distance and all of this other stuff. Again, applied physics. We actually mm. did hands on applied physics. And that's mm -hmm. what all of these like shop class in home ec. I love taking home ec. Why? I, 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 I'm a great cook, you know, if I pat myself on the back there. I, I, I am a great cook. And a lot of it came from going to home ec classes. And I love doing that. I can sew. I can do all of these things. I, you know, I've, I've taught my kids how to do a lot of those things. But I learned all of that in school. We just don't do it anymore. And I kind of wish that yeah. we did because, because there is a place for like these visual learners or learners of a different processes are, they, they just, they, I don't, I don't think I would have a place in modern school right now. Well, this directly affects our industry. It, we talk about labor shortages in construction all the time in the trades. Like it's, and, and how uncool has it become to be a tradesman in the last 30 years? Like yeah. it, it just wasn't even a, an option for right. teachers or parents to tell their kids about. Of course, it's happened in some ways, like it has somehow still happened 
in a very small percentage compared to what it used to be. Right. And, and, and like you talk about like the end times, right? You talk, <laughs> you talk about the apocalypse. Who needs a plumber? Everybody. Every, Who needs yeah. an electrician? Everybody. Everybody. How much do they charge? A lot, right? Like yeah. is what, whatever, you, whatever they'll, they'll charge is what you'll pay, right? Exactly. Because that's what you need. Do you know compare to that to it? architecture? No. Compare that to architecture, where exactly. it's a commoditization race to the bottom of of architectural fees, right? Mm-hmm. It's like charge less and less. Plumbers, electricians charge more and more. Like right. it, it's absolutely crazy how the tables have turned in that way. But it's also supply and demand, right? Where right. Right. architecture schools are pumping out white collar cubicle workers who are just going to go work for the Genslers of the world to, right. you know, keep the machine running and. Right. Yeah. Anyway. Yeah. No, I totally, totally agree. With you. It has like a direct effect on like our understanding of, you know, basic mechanics, basic structures, basic materials, and all of that other stuff have a direct effect on how we design. You know, because if you don't understand the limits of the, the materials that you're working with, you're just going to say, oh, you're going to, you're going to take whatever you're designing at face value. It's just going to be, oh, like this is the the standard details and I'm just going to like work Plug around the standard. Exactly. Copy paste. You yep. know, and, and the one thing that I love doing is stretching materials, you know, to their break. Like I actually had, you know, this, the thin detail that I did on the school in at Washington University in St. Louis, that, mm-hmm. that thin detail didn't exist in their repertoire. They had mm-hmm. a thin detail, but it didn't, it didn't cantilever like that. And I was asking them to cantilever four feet and they're like our terracotta doesn't cantilever like that and i'm like is there a way that we can do that and i was like what if we run the structure inside the terracotta fins and you're basically you bolt together and so you're you're really not actually cantilevering per se create a rigid frame you're creating been... a rigid frame yeah and they're like okay well let us you know run back to our engineers and, and run that through and now we came to a compromise and i i only was allowed to cantilever three feet but it didn't really change. Always the, start oh. with a bigger number, Cormac. This is the exactly. rule of negotiation. It di- it didn't change the overall. I dynamics. want a cantilever eight feet. Yeah, but but it <laughs> did. It, but guess what is now in that manufacturer's repertoire? That and you've done detail, it, and now somebody else can do it. And now right? somebody like, else can do it. You've you've shown that it's possible. And, exactly. And maybe somebody else will figure out, out a way right. to push it even farther. So. And hopefully they'll do a, a hell of a lot better than I did it. You know, I mean that. It, I won't be offended. In fact, I'll be. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> no, you'll you, you'll see that, and you'll be. They'll be like, "Oh yeah, yeah." I'm gonna try. I'm gonna try to push push back and go even farther next time. Exactly. Exactly. Cool stuff. I'm going for the eight feet though. Right. right. <laughs> well, highly recommended video. I'm so glad that you you sent those. I, I hadn't seen Van's video. Uh, I have. I you know the, I've obviously aware of Temple Grand and, and but yeah. it was it was also cool just to see kind of the profound effect that that her words had on him and. Mm-hmm. So we'll put links to the podcast that he referenced, the TED Talk that she was in, and right. then, of course, his video as well. Yeah. And yeah. just subscribe to all of his videos because they're, they're uh, amazing. They, they really are. Spirited Man. Mm. Spirited Man channel. That's right. All right, man. All right. Good talk. Thanks. Until next time.